Now we're going to turn to the militia soldiers, and we've got Sergeant Reed, first here on the left. You'll see we have kind of a progression, and then uh, Dan okay. and Rob. Kind of a progression of militia soldiers here. Sergeant Reed here with the 5th Indiana uh, Rifles, is an Indiana uh, militia unit that we would consider a uniform militia. As you can see, uh, his, his uniform and what he wears in his company elected their officers and from the officers they selected their NCOs and that's how rank was bestowed in militia. Uh, Matt carries a rifleman because the 5th Indiana was a, was a rifle regiment and he has a shooting bag, a powder horn that he would load from, he carries his tomahawk and knife he is, he is ready for war. He's, that's what we would call a full battle rally. He's ready to go. Now, Dan McAfee here is a Kentucky, the second regiment Kentucky militia. You'll note that it's a dark color, which was very common for a lot of the Ohio, Indiana, and Kentucky militia to wear dark color clothes because they were bringing their clothes from home. Whereas Sergeant Reed's frock color, that was something that their captain decided that they were going to be a uniform in color and frock and so that they all purchased and had made for them matching frocks whereas McAfee's split shirt obviously is something that he wore from home uh, it would blend in well into the woods and it's good for Indian fighting uh, you can see he carries a, a smooth bore uh, power which loads quickly and can be loaded from a cartridge as well as he can load it from a powder horn and shooting bag as well. So it's multi-purpose. You can shoot buckshot through there. Sergeant Reed is firing a patch round ball for accuracy. I cannot um, shoot buckshot through mine. And you would not shoot buckshot. It's a smaller caliber. Uh, his caliber here on this uh, power is 62, so it's, it packs a pretty good punch from hit. But it's a relatively short range weapon comparatively compared to Sergeant Reed's rifle. Uh, McAfee also has his fighting accoutrements there always carrying the ever-present tomahawk as described by many who describe Kentucky militia men and the same for Ohio and Indiana. Always carried the tomahawk, which is an adaptation from our red brothers there. Uh, and he's got a, uh, pull that out. That is a bayonet of sort for, and you'll notice for, for the um, fouling piece, smooth bores, it does not have it does not have the musket bayonet lug uh, on this particular uh, Springfield musket. The bayonet lug is on the bottom, not on the top, which you would think of as a sight. It's on the bottom, so the bayonet hooks on and twists and locks on to that lug. On a, uh, on a civilian fouling piece, they do not, it's not a military main weapon. So they way to turn that fouling piece into uh, the ability to have a bayonet of sorts, that is called a plug bayonet. plug bayonet, which just is inserted into the muzzle. It's large enough muzzle to do that. Sergeant Reed's rifle has a small enough caliber that you would not be able to have enough strength in the <coughs> to be able to do that. Therefore, if things got close, McAfee could put his plug bayonet on and go to work like that, whereas Sergeant Reed would simply drop his rifle and fight like the Indians, draw his tomahawk and knife. We have uh, Rob Howell here, the second Kentucky, is, is the frontiersman. This, this is similar to the Ohio, Indiana, and Kentucky frontiersman. Uh, Rob's a hunter, trapper. I mean, really, pretty much really is. <laughs> and, uh, and this would be a lot of clothes for Rob for this time of year. Like Simon Kick was known to run around in Kentucky and, and southern Ohio and things during this time period wearing nothing more than the Indian style breech club. And as militia and as a hunter and a scout, uh, those guys pretty much could do what they wanted as far as clothing wise. There was not a uniform uh, that was meant to be worn. It, it just did not make sense to the frontiersman, the hunter, uh, or the native in this time of year to burden yourself with a whole bunch of clothes, make you sweat, be uncomfortable, when you would strip down simply to a breech club and, and I'm wearing boots, but my moccasins fell apart, and 
I appropriated them from somebody's camp. Liberated them, <laughs> which happens quite often because my moccasins fell apart. Right. Now, Rob, he also has a smooth bore. Um, it's, it's a style after a fouling type piece, maybe even a trade gun. Trade gun. Again, large caliber, 20 gauge. And uh, he can fire the bucket ball. But it would be just as comfortable for Rob to have a rifle in his hands as it would be for him to have a smooth bore. It kind of depends. Even Daniel Boone, when he fought at the Battle of Blue Licks, who's noted for, for his rifle and his accuracy, carried an old tick licker, which was actually a 66 caliber rifle. Uh, Boone, when he went and they were riding horses to the Battle of Blue Licks, he carried his fountain piece. He carried his smooth bore because he knew the fighting that in, in the woods in that area was going to be close. And the fact with the smooth bores, you can have cartridges prepared and in your bag, pull them out, tear it. We're going to get into that when we talk about loading. But you can load quickly with a smooth bore and you can shoot a bucket ball, which is very effective at your close range. You have the wide brim floppy hat that both uh, Dan and Bob wear was pretty much indicative of the militiamen and carried on clear through the Civil War. The wide brim floppy hat uh, makes it uh, something you can give yourself a lot more shade cover shadows your eyes better, and it was something that they wore at home. They were not being issued uh, garments and very much equipment ever from the government on the western frontier. Also, if you'll note this, when I tell these men, attention, shoulder, arms, you'll notice that Rob's round, or a wide brim hat flipped up on the brim allows him to do his manual of arms close without getting and ticking the brim. McAfee would have a little bit more difficulty, and this is just considered a moderately wide, wide brim. Some of the guys have a lot wider than that. And the round hat, you'll notice, was a hat that had the brim trimmed out even shorter so that you didn't have to flip it up, and yet you can continue to do the manual of arms. Order arms. So adaptations for the military use, depending on the hat wear, it is typical of Ohio, Kentucky, Indiana militia, they're short-term enlistments. They could be a 30-day enlistment, a 60-day, a six-month. And they many times wore what they had at home. They brought their own guns from home. They wore the clothes that they had for home. If you were a Eastern militiaman, uh, many times there was a lot more money in those cities where they called the must together. And the city or the county that you were part of uh, outfitted you. They would provide you with the muskets, they would provide you with your uniform, and many times you could hardly tell the difference between the eastern states' militia from the U.S. regulars, other than they were short-term enlistment periods uh, relative to uh, the U.S. regulars. Um, and it's getting close to harvest time, I'm fixing to head for home. So, <laughs> get close to harvest time, I'm head for home. When they, they enlist, they volunteer to fight, they go fight. When they volunteer to go home, they go home. The muskets have very large flints and a very large lock. It was uh, expected that a uh, infantryman would be able to proficiently load and fire three rounds a minute. So that's with cartridge, load and fire about every 20 seconds. Four rounds a minute is possible. To add the accuracy, we dispense with that and just put his powder down the barrel and put his round ball and drop it down and hammer it on the butt like that to settle the ball. He could keep up and load just as fast as a musket man or a fowling pieces uh, with a rifle and his range would be slightly further than with these guns because for one thing he has a rear sight on a rifle and a front sight which gives him a, a, an advantage for taking fine aim. The fouling pieces and the musket, none of them have rear sights. The fouling pieces actually have true front sights and the 1795 had a true front sight. Uh, for the musket, the military musket, the idea in the Napoleonic style of fighting of linear tactics standing shoulder to shoulder and you're firing at a, a, an opponent who's 50 to 60 yards away and you level your gun and you fire a volley, a mass volley, into the enemy, it's more about speed of loading than it is about fine accuracy. You're trying to put as many round balls into them before they put them into you. And one of the things that I'm rather proud of for the Americans is that uh, 
we had a tendency to fight the British using bucket ball. So we had a we had the large musket round ball in there, followed by about eight to ten small caliber buckshot load, and we packed that down. Now the British officers they didn't seem to think that was very gentlemanly of us, but when it came down to firing three rounds a minute of bucket ball into your opponent, and you've got that buckshot spray of those small calibers hitting guys on either side of the guy that you're generally pointing in his direction at. Uh, the American Army fared pretty well in straight on competition with the British. Uh, typically in the early years with the British, they are so well trained that they, they could stand there and, and take it, whereas a lot of American armies and militia, when they saw that big red line moving at you and they would level and fire uh, volleys into you quite proficiently, many times the eastern militia states, and uh, they break and run. And uh, so, but those guys over there, they were not used to dealing with frontiersmen of Ohio, Indiana, Kentucky, and they learned that uh, we don't typically run from fights over here. They also thought riflemen were murderers. Because see, with theirs, they're, they're so inaccurate that if you just pointed and fired, it's, it's God's will if somebody gets hit. You're not aiming for one individual, you're just pointing in that direction, and it's not on you if, if it's that guy gets guy. hit. While as riflemen, we are taking careful aim at a particular individual. So we were considered as murderers on the battlefield. <laughs> and the, uh, and the, to the, them we were. The, the militiamen. And treated us as such if we were captured. Yep. We were not prisoners <laughs> of war, we were captured murderers. And executed, typically. Mm -hmm. Now the Kentuckians, Ohio, Kentucky militiamen firing their rifles, um, as during the Revolutionary War, the men, men with their rifles took exceptional, <laughs> took exceptional uh, delight in singling out the enemy's officers and senior NCOs as their first targets at any open engagement, which was very disruptive to a uh, well-trained British line who all of a sudden, at the first volley from the Americans, many of their commanders uh, hit the ground. They, they were kind of at a loss, waiting for somebody to tell them what to do. Anybody have any questions? I think we covered it fairly well. You did. Thank you very much. Well, Excellent. Well done, gentlemen.